Well, good morning, students, or good afternoon, or good evening, or wherever you now find you. We want to continue thinking about Aristotle and friendship, and to do that, we want to understand how he thinks about being human, and what he thinks is good for human beings, and what their meaning and purpose is. Now, last time we talked about what is necessary and what is fine, and how they related to the idea of friendship. Because according to Aristotle, friendship is both necessary and fine. As being necessary, it's part of our defining limits in all our human interactions. It's impossible to imagine fully functioning as a human being without the virtue or the excellence of friendship. Even politics is impossible for Aristotle to conceive of without the defining characteristic of friendship. We discuss what that Greek word kalos, translated as fine, means with its three distinct senses. Beautiful in appearance, as my lover is so fine, so kalos. Useful for a purpose, as dropping anchor in a fine or kalos harbor. Or noble, like Martin Luther King Jr. led such a noble, fine, kalos life. And that third sense of being good and noble takes us to the heart of Aristotle's idea of what defines friendship, that it's something more than what is necessary, something added on. When you go out of your way to do something you don't need to do, it's kalos in this sense. Well, you didn't really have to do that, someone might say admiringly, if you do some beautiful thing. So we learn that the heart of philia, the Greek word for friendship love, is found in what is lovable because it's good while the other two types of friendship are only thought of as friends in relation to that core meaning. Someone can be lovable because they are pleasant, they make you feel good, or someone can be lovable because they are useful to you, or someone can be lovable to you just because of who they are. You appreciate their character for its own sake, character being the way someone typically acts in recurring situations, revealing a constant pattern of behavior. Now, we learned that in addition, in each of these cases, for friendship to exist, there must be reciprocated goodwill. Each must wish good to the other and be aware of it. We talked about friends of utility and friends of pleasure, and how these relationships are coincidental and not constant, since they're the product of changing circumstances, in contrast to complete or perfect friendship. Complete friendship is reciprocated goodwill between people who are good and similar in excellence of character. So complete friendship based in goodness and virtue also uh, will be pleasant and useful, but the pleasantness and usefulness are the effect and not the cause of the friendship, because only in complete friendship are the two friends really friends to each other simply because of who that other person is. If a friendship was for utility or pleasure, Aristotle points out, obviously it would be for your sake. But in a real friendship, you move beyond necessity to something that is noble, something that is coloss in the highest sense. So Aristotle says that the friendship of good people, insofar as they are good, is friendship in the primary way and to the full extent. And the others are called friends just because they're similar to this. We might put it like this in a logical sense. While all complete friends are useful and pleasant to us, not all who are useful and pleasant are complete friends. Just like while all males are human, not all humans are males. So first, let's think about some terms and concepts Aristotle is using when he thinks about how to live as a human being. To understand ethics, right, we have to understand how he thinks human beings are, and how they find meaning and purpose in their lives. Now, translations will usually have Aristotle talking about happiness, uh, but as usual, that's not a good translation. At a first approximation, wherever it says happiness, replace it in your mind with flourishing. The Greek, the Greek word that Aristotle is using is eudaimonia, right? Eudaimonia. And that's not equated with pleasure or like feeling good or happy in, that, in the sense we would use the word happiness. But it relates to the fulfillment of human purpose in the sense of the best 
thing you can find to complete your life, right? He says that if in all our actions there is some purpose which we seek for its own sake and not as means to another end, that would be the final complete and perfect good. Okay. Now, if we think about the good as Aristotle thinks about it, we have to look at the world like he does. Okay. And maybe you look at the world like this too. He thinks that we live in a world full of meaning and purpose. And this is called a teleological worldview. That comes from the Greek word telos, which means purpose or meaning. He thinks that everything in the world um, is striving to achieve its purpose. Right? Uh, acorns strive to become oak trees. Baby animals strive to become grown animals. And everything is trying to become the best thing it can be in this sense to find its meaning or purpose. Now in doing this, I think we can view Aristotle as giving what is called a phenomenological account. By that I don't mean he thought he was being a phenomenologist. He thought he was describing the basic structures of the universe. But I think what he was actually doing was describing how human beings perceive the world in certain characteristic ways. And in doing so, he's given what I call a phenomenological account. Read along with me here so we can think about what phenomenology means. At the turn of the 20th century, a fellow named Edmund Husserl founded a movement in philosophy called phenomenology. The slogan of his movement was, Zazaka selbst, back to the things themselves, back to what we actually experience as living human beings. And his word for what we actually experience as living human beings was phenomena. And so we have phenomenology the study of lived experience. Husserl thought that we should seek as philosophers to experience the phenomena of our lives as carefully as we can and put that experience into words. But the words are really pointers, fingers pointing at the moon of the experience, which you must ultimately experience for yourself. And words can not only point us to the things themselves, they can also serve to cover them up and conceal them. So the task of analyzing and describing what is given to us in experience is made difficult because we have been raised with a set of inherited assumptions, a web of words founded in social practices that can point us away from or obscure how things really are. So, Husserl said, we need to suspend our belief in these inherited dogmas and only believe what we can experience for ourselves. We must assume nothing, but instead look to what we actually experience trying to see it once again for the first time. Now, when we do this, we discover a world of reason and wonder, a world of wondering reason. When we look back at the history of philosophy, I think we can see a sort of forecast or a, a presager of this in the way, say, people like Plato or Aristotle or any of the, the uh, philosophers down through the ages did philosophy. They were trying to describe what it meant to be human. They didn't understand it exactly in Husserl's sense, but we can find in them, nonetheless, a rich phenomenological account of being human. Notice I say here, despite his many limitations, Aristotle was a person of his own time, right? He had, uh, I think, a very poor view of women. He had a poor view of non-Greeks. But that doesn't negate the fact that when he thought he was describing how a Greek male experienced the world, he would occasionally describe just how a human being experienced the world in a very rich and powerful way. And we can sort of mine him, correct for distortion, and find things in him that can help us understand our own lives. Uh, in a sense, we can deconstruct Aristotle and look for his phen phenomenological insights and, and find something to aid us in the self-knowledge of what it means to be human. Now Aristotle says in the Nicomachean Ethics that the final telos is the agathos, and it is teleos, right? The final purpose or meaning is the good, and it is complete or perfect.
right? He means perfect in the sense that there's nothing lacking. It, it just hangs together in a complete sense. And when we look at the good, he said we can think of a good aimed at by a rational agent to achieve a purpose. So there are as many goods in this sense as there are rational aims. Like, I could have the aim of uh, cooking and eating breakfast so I'm not hungry. <laughs> There's a good for which something is done. A result if there are reasons to aim for it. Like having ate my breakfast. And then there's a good X, when X fulfills its characteristic function. And these are then all related. A good X depends on what good is aimed at, which then depends on what X is good for. And the question we can ask is, what do all human actions aim at? What are they done for? Now, if we think of what field of knowledge this falls in, Aristotle thinks we will see it has to be politike, as he calls it. Uh, politics, but it doesn't mean politics like we would use the word today. Pol politike for Aristotle meant the knowledge that concerns how we live a good life with each other as social animals together in an ordered community of citizens. So in a sense, all study of ethike or ethics, the knowledge of how we live a good life as individuals, is always thought of within this social context. For the good of the community of which the individual is an inextricable part is the ultimate presupposition of all discussions of the human good. For Aristotle, it's not possible to really think of being fully human apart from the human community, and it is only in community with others that we could ever realize our highest good. Now, another key thing is that this cannot be an exact kind of knowledge, Aristotle said. Instead, he calls it knowledge of what is true for the most part. Um, the topics of flourishing in a society concern what is fine and what is just. Right? Uh, doing the right thing. And if we look at what actual societies consider fine and just or doing the right thing, we'll find there's no exact agreement. And what individuals find for them to be good on an individual level seems to vary in many ways, too. So in this kind of discussion, he says, we can only aim at what is usually the case, what is true for the most part. So what we find our beginnings, he thought, in looking at what most people usually agree on, and think that through, and try to rationalize it, and make it as reasonable as we can. And he says that people generally agree that eudaimonia, happiness is what most people aim at, but they disagree about what it is. Many people, he says, think that to be an excellent or flourishing human being uh, is something obvious, like pleasure, wealth, and honor. And each one, he says, seems to pick the one obvious to him, depending on his or her changing circumstances. While some of the wise thought there was a good in itself, which cause these various goods to be good. Aristotle will seek to give an account of the good, which can best summarize and reconcile all these elements in a comprehensive account of what it means to be human. So what does it mean for a human being to flourish, to be excellent, to be happy? Okay. Let's think about that. Aristotle says that it's clear that in every action and decision, the good is that for the sake of which other things are done. The telos, which is its reason why, its meaning and purpose. As the good of the acorn, for example, is to become a functioning, flourishing oak tree. So the most completely realized end goal or purpose would be the most complete good, and happiness in the sense of flourishing seems to fit this description best of all. The best good, he says, would also be something complete and self-sufficient. The Greek word is autarkes, which means something that does not depend on something else for it to be worthwhile. So it would be a purpose worthwhile in itself and would be unconditional and complete. And here it's important to understand the idea of an extrinsic good versus an intrinsic good. If something is an intrinsic good, if it has intrinsic value, then it has that value by itself, just by being what it is. This means that it has that value not because it can be used as a means to acquire other things, 
but just because of what it is. But if something is an extrinsic good, has extrinsic value, it has that value because it can be used as a means to acquire other things that have value. It's an instrumental good used to achieve other things which have value in themselves. For Aristotle, eudaimonia, flourishing, is the most final and complete intrinsic good for human beings. Now, Aristotle thinks that only eudaimonia is unconditional and complete in this way, since we always choose it for itself, and not as a means for some end. It's an intrinsic good. And again, something is only best and good when it is self-sufficient in the sense of all by itself making a life worthwhile. But remember, for Aristotle, always given the appropriate social and political environment. So, for example, if we think of a flourishing tree, that tree cannot flourish without the soil, the water, the sunshine, the gravity field it's growing in, right? And all of that, its whole environment. The same way with the human being. When he talks about us being self-sufficient, he means in the appropriate environment and context of social community. As soil, water, and sunshine are to the flourishing tree, so is the social community to the human being. In that light, consider these two quotes. For Aristotle, the goal of life is to maximize happiness by living virtuously, with excellence, fulfilling your own potential as a human, engaging with others, family, friends, and fellow citizens in a mutually beneficial and mutually beneficial activities. And then Aristotle says, no one would choose the whole world on the condition of being alone, since humans are political creatures and one whose nature it is to live with others. Now when he says we're political creatures, remember though, he means politikos in the sense of living in mutually enriching ways with each other in a social context, right? Very different from what we mean by politics. Now think, Aristotle says, if something has a function, its good must depend on that function. And the function is found in the meaning or purpose of the thing. If, and if we think about each level of life of which human beings are a part, each level of life that we have within us has a certain structure an organized pattern of growth and development toward its particular goal, end, or purpose. And this is what Aristotle called psuche, or soul, uh, or a word that's usually translated as soul. Now, by soul, he doesn't mean what the word probably calls up into your mind, which is some sort of maybe glowing thing inside you that flies off to heaven when you die or something, or some sort of immaterial thing in you, right? That's sort of reading older meanings back into ancient times. Aristotle had something very different in mind when he used this word psuche, which again is translated as soul, but he doesn't, didn't mean it in any sort of supernatural sense at all. Let me explain. By psuche, he means something like an organized pattern of growth and development toward the goal or purpose of the organism, a sort of organizational structure. So you can see that it being translated as soul could be a little confusing. If you, ha if you heard him talk about plant soul, you might think he was some sort of quaint, um, ancient guy who had some really weird ideas. But if instead you read it as the organizational structure of the plant as it grows toward its meaning or purpose, that would be something different, right? So Aristotle thought we can characterize levels of functioning, levels of psuche in living organisms. And these are then established in a hierarchy, with the lower contained within the next level. The next level is rooted in the lower level and supports it. Or you could think of it like the Russian nesting dolls. At the very center is what he calls uh, plant psuche, uh, and he picks plant as just, uh, plants as just a sort of typical example. And I'll explain that in a minute. And then around that would be the animal psuche. And then finally for us, the human. Plants give us a typical example of the first functional level of living process, right? Which Aristotle calls the nutritive structure of life. 
This is the base which maintains an organism's physical balance as a, a sort of living thing. As the organism consumes food, something must control this in addition so that the process of growth happens in accordance with the plan of the organism. And the meaning or purpose of suke at this level is simply to keep the organism alive in its environment, to enable it to grow and reproduce. And that is the eudaimonia, the flourishing or happiness of the nutritive level of functioning. At this level, we take in food and water and grow and, and, and reproduce. Right? The second level, he calls animal suke. Right? And this is the perceptive structure of life. We're sort of maintaining sensory equilibrium. It includes the so-called plant functions, but adds sight, touch, taste, and hearing, which all combine into memory and result in the animal f flourishing uh, of the pleasure of health in the material environment. In the human, we see a third level of functioning that's only possible for human beings, which Aristotle calls rational suke, the rational structure of life. And this can be made clear by a distinction between uh, Ringo here, this doggy Ringo, and me, while we're looking at two desks. Ringo sadly is no longer with us, but Ringo was a good friend of mine, and I like to remember him. Okay? Now, Ringo and I both share, or shared, the nutritive and perceptive levels of functioning. For example, we could say that Ringo recognizes me, recognition being an activity essential to the perceptive level. Aristotle says that the success of perceptions can give rise to a new kind of experience, where Ringo sees not some random thing, but a curious gestalt composed of all the times I've fed him, played with him, uh, hollered at him when he did something silly, and so forth, which gives a kind of animal transcendence. Ringo sees his human being in his own doggy way of seeing that. Aristotle says that even bees show memory. But at the human level, this expands into something new. Suppose Ringo and I are looking at two desks. I don't just see this as my two desks as Ringo sees, say, my human, but I can see it, I can see them as desks, as members of the class of desks. Ringo can be having the same exact sensory experience as I am having, and even remember the desks in some way. But Ringo can never see the desks as a desk. A new kind of gestalt emerges, which involves recognition of the universal and we move beyond perception and memory into the realm of reason. At this level of functioning as rational animals, we can use our sensory experience to break out, the, break out of the present experience and the past experience of memory out of our immediate sensory environment and begin to think in terms of purposes, goals, and final purposes. We can begin to find a life of meaning in the rational sense. To be fully human, then, we must fulfill this characteristic function of being human if we are to flourish. So let's consider this rational level of functioning, the level of human suke, in a little more detail. Okay? The key to it is the idea of recognizing the universal and the particular. The key to recognizing sameness and difference is the ability to recognize universals or class concepts. Without that ability, thinking would be impossible. Now, a universal is the idea of a category, while a particular refers to the actual individual things that make up the category. And categories are simply classes or groups of things. The words we use to name a category or class are then called terms. Here are a few examples of terms that name categories of things. Human beings, apples, quasars, clouds, teachers, students, dogs and If you think about language and how we use it to orient ourselves in the world, you will see that we do this through classification into categories, which we could also call sets. For example, think of, think of books you have read. You could classify them according to source, found in the bookstore, library, or online, subject, history, statistics, brewing, beer, 
or you could categorize them according to the level of pleasure you took in reading it. It could be interesting, boring, or delightful. When you do this, using whatever scheme of classification you choose, you group these things together in terms of something common, something that is the same and that makes them different from other things. We could, for example, walk outside down by the lake on campus by the chapel, look around and begin to categorize or classify the world around us. We could think of organic things and inorganic things, for example. We could then further think about how organic things include things like us, human things, as well as birds, fishes, insects, and so forth, while we could categorize many other things as inorganic, such as benches, rocks, and so forth. We could also see things that can be members of more than one category. So birds are members of the class of flying things, breathing things, egg-laying things, and so forth, while they are not members of the class of rocks. This ability to classify seems to be something almost distinctively human. So think about Ringo and me again. We can imagine that Ringo can sense the desk quite well, and can even remember them in some inchoate sense. But what we cannot imagine is Ringo recognizing that both objects are types of objects which can be identified as members of the set of desks. And we certainly cannot imagine Ringo remembering them as particular desks that are members of the abstract set of desks and then communicating that fact to us. Now remember what we went over just before this. The final purpose or meaning is the good, and it is complete or perfect. And here we're focusing on the idea of a good X, when X fulfills its characteristic function. This is the sort of core meaning we're trying to get at here. We had the good aimed at to achieve an end or purpose, a good for which something is done, and then a good X when X fulfills its characteristic function. And the question is, what do all human actions aim at? What are they done for? Well, for Aristotle, uh, to flourish, which is what we're aiming at, to be a fully flourishing, functioning, excellent human being, we have to fulfill our characteristic function of rationality to fully realize our purpose of human flourishing. Now, the function of the human includes nutrition, growth, and reproduction, like the plants. It also includes sense perception and mobility in the environment, like the animals. These must be present, too. Aristotle is a very practical thinker. He doesn't think that eating and drinking and growing and having babies and being able to sense things in our environment and move around in it and remember things and orient ourselves in our environment are lesser things. They're necessary things, right? But they're not what make us fully human. But our true excellence, our erite or virtue, is found in the exercise of our rational faculties, which are sort of built on top of those other things. So human eudaimonia, or flourishing, he says, is some sort of life involving the activity of reasoning. So to live a good life is to fulfill the unique potential of the human suke and the activity of reason in the context of the human community. And at the heart of it all, he says, is friendship. Friendship is at the heart of being the social and political animal that we are. Look at that. I got a mistake there. Let me correct it. Now, let's consider this quote. After what we have said, a discussion of friendship would naturally follow, since it is a virtue or implies virtue, and is besides most necessary with a view to living. For without friends, no one would choose to live, though he had all other goods. Even rich men, and those in possession of office and of dominating power, are thought to need friends most of all. For what is the use of such prosperity without the opportunity of beneficence, which is exercised chiefly and in its most laudable form toward friends? Or how can prosperity be guarded and preserved without friends? And in poverty and other misfortunes, men think friends are the only refuge. It helps the young, too, to keep from error. It aids older people by ministering to their needs and supplementing the activities that are failing from weakness. 
those in the prime of life, it stimulates to noble, callous actions, two going together. For with friends, men are more able both to think and to act, and women too. <laughs> Again, parents seem by nature to feel it for offspring, and offspring for parent, not only among men or women, but among birds and among most animals. We may even in our travels note how near and dear every man or woman is to every other. Friendship seems to hold states together, and lawmakers to care more for it than for justice, for unanimity seems to be something like friendship. In this they aim at most of all, and expel faction as their worst enemy. And when men are friends, they have no need of justice. While when they are just, they need friendship as well. And the truest form of justice is thought to be a friendly quality. But it is not only necessary, but also fine. For we praise those who love their friends, and it is thought to be a fine thing to have many friends. And again, we think it is the same people that are good men and our friends. And of course, good women too. We have to remember to correct Aristotle for his distortions. So thank you for your kind attention as we continue to try to think through the idea of friendship.